Our next topic is parallel computing. So what is parallel computing? It means basically that you do many calculations simultaneously, that means concurrently at the same time, or that you run various processes at the same time. So in parallel you run many processes, or many calculations. So the goals of parallel computing are to improve performance for an application. So that typically means to allow you to solve a problem within a deadline, for example to compute the weather of tomorrow, you, you want to do that in a couple of hours, not in three days, because you want to have it ready by tomorrow. Or you want to increase the accuracy, for example, of a scientific simulation, of physics simulations and so forth. Additional characteristics are that the application system somehow must coordinate the otherwise independent parallel processing units. And there are various programming models for parallel applications. So, and there are also different architectures that allow you to speed up this computation to achieve these goals. One of them is actually to use a distributed system that we already learned from. About. There are different levels of parallelism that you can think about when you look from the hardware side. For example, at bit level, that means that you want to process multiple bits concurrently, for example in an ALU. At instruction level, that means that you want to process multiple instructions concurrently, for instance in your CPU, you run multiple instructions at the same time. Data parallelism means to run the same computation of on different data and task parallelism means to run different computations at the same time. So in practice there are two paradigms for parallel architectures and you see mixes of both in real cluster systems. So in a shared memory system you have one memory that can be accessed by multiple processors so the memory is shared Note that this computer system actually has internally some kind of network, communication network, to allow the access, to co the um, coordinated access to the memory by the different processes. So actually your mobile device nowadays, your computer, they are all shared memory systems. So you have multiple processors inside, multiple cores that access the same memory. The problem this, this architecture has is that it cannot be scaled up to any size. So it's really difficult to say, I want to have a 100,000 processor shared memory machine. It's very difficult because there's always the problem to access this, this memory via some kind of bus here. And the second architecture is actually our distributed memory system. Again, where processors can only see their own memory and if you talk about performance of parallel computation, actually you need a very performant network to allow this kind of coordinated application to compute some kind of you know, simulation for you. So speaking about simulations and parallel programs. So a parallel program runs on whatever parallel hardware you have. And in the strict sense we could say that our parallel application in fact coordinates concurrent processing. So here we see on the left side a schema of a multi-core processor. So we have a microprocessor that has a core, like quad cores nowadays are quite common, or octa cores with eight cores, and they are, this microprocessor is actually one physical chip, okay, that integrates all this kind of logic inside. So you have the cores and you have cache, which is some kind of very fast memory and those cores communicate with our with an internal network which then they communicate to a memory controller which then has some kind of external memory typically those kind of dims that you put into your hardware so our processor that we see on the left side provides various levels of parallelism first of all if you look in one core inside you would find that you have different multiple alu systems and other units that can work concurrently of different kind of instructions. You pipeline the processing stages inside the core, so that means that you overlap different operations, following follow-up operations. 
we have a single instruction, multiple data, the SIMD principle. That means that you have one operation that runs on multiple data, like multiply this vector of four elements with two. Right? This is an operation that you may want to do, for instance. There are different instruction sets, like SSE and AVX, that do that. And you have multiple cores. So each of these cores are kind of their own independent CPU, logically. That means they have their own instruction pointer and they can work on an independent program. So high performance computing, or in short HPC, is the field that provides massive compute resources for computational tasks. So such a task, right, need too much memory or time to run on a normal computer or server systems. Like you, you have challenging simulation like simulations like weather, astronomy, that can only be done using HPC. And a supercomputer in HPC is basically a computer, not a, just a sing, single computer, but like a distributed system that aggregates the power of many compute devices together. Like, for example, nowadays thousands of servers work together to form a supercomputer. Here is the characteristics of the Summit supercomputer that is at Oak Ridge National Laboratories in the US. It consists of 4,608 compute nodes and has about 2.4 million cores. That's a lot. It peak performance is about 200 petaflops per second, means 10 to the power of 15 um, floating point operations per second can be executed. Each of these nodes consists of two um, of those um, CPUs, microprocessors, and six NVIDIA GPUs. It has totally about 10 petabytes of memory. It has 100 gigabit InfiniBand, which means you have about 12.5 gigabyte per second throughput sustained for each node, and a total of 112 terabyte per second B section bandwidth. So that means how, how nodes can communicate with each other. The total bandwidth is about 115 terabytes per second. Storage is about 32 petabytes capacity and one terabyte per second throughput. It's really a great computer and there exists the top 500 list and you, if you, you know, I have a couple of links embedded um, into the slides and like here and you see when you move your mouse over you can follow the link. Um, the top 500 is a really a great list um, that tracks publicly announced characteristics of supercomputers and you can find a lot more about this there. Okay, so how does such a data center look like? Well, it can look really nice, like here in this picture. Or if you go inside and you turn off the lights, it's actually a crude set of racks. So really a set of shells, basically, with computer servers mounted inside, cooling, noisy, and all that. And then they are connected using some cables. Here we see some cable over the ceiling. Typically, the cables are also on the, the floor, which is um, kind of circulating the air around. Okay, so we have these data centers. Physically, this is how they look like. So how do we communicate with and access the resources in there, right? So we are users. Somehow we connect via the internet or the cloud, well, it doesn't matter, to the data center, right? Typically, it happens, the data center is somehow connected to the internet, of course, so the user can log in into a node here and then perform some operations. The schema also shows that we may have different nodes in the data center with equipped with different um, you know, hardware. Here is non-volatile memory. We have some central storage, for example, and archive options to store data for long term. Challenges in parallel computing are basically imported from distributed computing. So the same problems. But there is also a second problem because here it's really about performance. So it's really hard to get performant code by performance, we also talk about efficiency. You want to make best use of these available hardware resources. More about it later. And a lot of that means you have to use low-level APIs and do a lot of code optimization, which is hard to do for experts. And it's really expensive and challenging to debug thousands of concurrently pro running processes that work together. You want to utilize these resources efficiently, like I said. That means you want to balance out the load. And if you have grand challenges like weather and climate and so forth, it's actually difficult to test, right? To write tests in the um, computer science way because you don't know the true answer, right? 
if you compute a fusion reactor, how, you know, how, how should it be built? What, what is its characteristics? Well, how do you write a test for it? Well, it's tough. Next challenge is scalability. Um, the scalability is really more hard than for distributed systems because you really are interested in this performance aspect. There are two scalability aspects that are looked at typically. One is called strong scaling. That means you take the same problem and you basically parallelize this further across more hardware. You distribute it wider and that hopefully increases performance, right? And the second aspect is weak scaling. That means you increase the amount of work with the number of processors working, doing this, working on this problem and to retain the time to solution. Weak scaling is much easier to achieve than strong scaling. More about it later again. Okay, the environment in, in high performance computing is typically bleeding edge. That mean, and you have a varying number of hardware and software systems. Sometimes you have obscure special purpose hardware, FPGAs, ASICs, which are application specific integrated circuits and so on. Um, that means it's really hard to administrate because it's bleeding edge, hard to use, and sometimes hard to compare the performance with. 